Hi, and welcome to today's set of Q&A questions on Piano TV. I'm Alicia, and I'm a piano teacher, and I am here to answer four questions today. We're going to be talking about all kinds of different topics, from everything from polyrhythms to flying pinkies. And as always, if you have any questions that you want to ask, be free, be free, always be free. Feel free to leave them in the comments below, and I will, you know, pick a handful to answer next month. I like doing these every month or so. Anyway, let's get to it. So the first question is by Dragotants, and he asks, any tips for learning the four versus three structure in Chopin's Fantasy Impromptu? I'm finding it difficult with the hands not being synchronized, and would a metronome help? This is a crazy challenging piece, and one of the biggest challenges of this piece is the polyrhythm. Polyrhythm is basically when each of your hands is doing a different rhythm or playing in a different meter. So in this example, what's going on is your right hand is doing 16th notes in groups of four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, etc. It's playing in fours where the left hand is playing sextuplets or notes in groups of six, which is kind of like a you could think of it in a smaller division as groups of three or triplets. So that's what he's talking about when he's asking the question four versus three. Your right hand is going in patterns of four notes and your left hand is going in patterns of three notes. Basically what this means is that the hands aren't going to neatly align on every note when you play it hands together. Other examples of this polyrhythm would be in Debussy's first arabesque. You can kind of see the reverse situation or it's three on two. So you have triplets in the right hand and then just regular eighth notes in the left hand. An easier version of polyrhythm would be this one by Max Richter, where you have triplets in the right hand, just regular. This is like the Debussy example, but a little bit simpler. And then eighth notes in the left hand. Or basically any Chopin piece ever. It's a lot of Chopin with polyrhythm. How I learned to do these was by literally drawing lines to visualize where the notes are matching up. So these ones are played at the same time. These ones are played at the same time, but these ones are not. They kind of zigzag around a little bit. So together, da, 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 together, da, da, da. And I really needed to like literally draw in there just, just to see, or like you could draw the notes that don't quite match up as like little squiggly lines that go to like this. Sometimes I do this with my students' music. So then after, you know, marking up my page drawing, I would play them really slowly and at first super awkwardly. And then once my fingers are able to coordinate it really slow, that's when I started gradually picking up speed until it starts feeling more natural. So I'm just gonna quickly walk you through my process of reading this. So at first just start by figuring out the, the feel, the rhythm of each hand separately. So. Richter one, by the way, just because it, it, it's the easiest and I think it'll be easier to illustrate the point. And then the left hand is just a simple one and two and one. It's a straight beat, whereas our six eight beat is kind of like a like a swaying, rocking beat. So they they both have completely different different feels. So once I start lining it up, I'll, I'll do it in slow motion. I don't worry about like matching it up like 100% exactly perfect rhythm. I just want to make sure that I figure out how to slip that that second note so the first ones match up, right? And then right, right, and then they match up again. So it's just like trying to figure out how to how to coordinate the the notes that don't line up. So I I get my fingers used to that in slow motion, and then that's where I'll start going. and then I'll record myself doing it and listen to it just to see how even my rhythm is one part at a time. And then eventually... So I think that was pretty even. It's hard to listen to two parts at once when you're playing, so what I would do is I would go back and listen to that and just make sure it was even. If it was, then great, I'll keep speeding it up. Um, you should find that once you get the finger pattern down, you can start finding that ease a little bit more. And if you lose your rhythm, just start going through it again. So if this is how fast I want my left hand to be, I might just play it through a couple times. I can't remember 
remember exactly what my first polyrhythm piece was, but it was probably, like, if I had to guess, it's like a 9 out of 10 chance it was something by Chopin. So, I mean, I, I have a vague memory of just doing it over and over and over, and then it got to the point where it started feeling natural, but it didn't for a while, so just be patient with it. And I mean, if this is your first polyrhythm piece, if you've never done something like this before, it might be a good idea to go back and do something slightly easier, like Debussy's Arabesque. It's not much easier, but it's, it's a little bit easier. The next question is from Charles Lane, and his question is about fingerings. So we're gonna kind of paraphrase this a little bit, but he's learning minuet in G and is having difficulty with the left hand because all of the finger markings for the left hand pattern are five, four, two, one on the arpeggio from G to B to D. We'll look at the music in a second, but I'm just kind of writing this down. So he says it feels super unnatural. It's a lot easier to play with finger three instead of finger four. So he gets a little deeper into it. So are these fingerings merely suggestions that are not to be taken 100% literally? Or is it a learning piece with the goal to be to force the hand into a particular configuration with the purpose of training the muscle to build up the strength to do it with ease and comfort? This is an awesome question. My my personal rule is that I always try out the fingering that's on the page. So what I, I just go in with the assumption that the person who made those finger marks, they're smarter than me and they have a reason for marking it in that way. So I'll try it out, I'll see if it makes sense, I'll really try to make it work. And if it does work, awesome. But if it doesn't, I'm pretty comfortable changing the fingering if need be. In this case, I would say you can use finger three with no problems. The five, three, two, one stretch is, it is more natural and comfortable and that's how I play it. I, I, I think it's okay. Your fourth finger will have other challenges and other pieces. So it's not like this is your one opportunity to strengthen it or anything like that. But I wanna say this with a caveat. I am super leery of beginners changing finger patterns because if you're a beginner, you probably don't know what's best for you or your fingers when you're starting. So if you've been playing a year or two, you, you can probably make some better decisions when you're changing the finger markings. But if you're just starting out, like I would 99% of the time stick to what's on the page, but that doesn't seem to be the case for you. So go ahead and change it. Basically like the main problem I see when students ignore the fingering on the page is either their playing becomes sloppy because they're just, they're ignoring the finger mark and they're not making consistent logical choices, or they change the finger markings that make it easier to play at first, but then when they have to speed the piece up, it becomes sloppy. Sometimes, sometimes finger patterns seem weird until we try to play them fast, and then we are like, oh, okay, that's why we have to do this weird finger pattern. That's happened to me a lot of times. So I know that's a long answer to a seemingly simple question, but there was a lot in there that I wanted to unpack. Yes, feel free to use finger three there. I don't think it's the end of the world, but always spend a little bit of time carefully considering the finger markings that are in your books. Just to, just to see, like maybe, maybe they're smarter than you and know something that you don't. But this is not one of those instances, I don't think. Someone can, like, if anyone thinks I'm wrong, please tell me, because I think it's, I'm open to know why we would want to use figure four there. So yes, finger markings are just suggestions. They are not 100% law. Joseph One asks the question, I have a problem with my fifth finger in the right hand. Uh, interestingly, not the left hand. It flies up and gets separated from the other fingers. It becomes a big problem when I'm playing scales. Can you tell me what to do to avoid this flying pinky, which is the best expression ever, right? <laughs> this is a super common problem and it's really not that huge of a deal. I mean, when you're starting out, your fingers aren't gonna be super coordinated. W with time, I notice my students' fingers start to relax and curve a little bit more neatly. When you start, you might find that fingers kind of claw out a little bit um, and even now that I've been I've been playing since I was a kid um, my pinky will still lift a little bit like if I'm doing like when I'm just kind of rolling through scales and stuff you'll notice that my pinky this is just kind of where it hangs comfortably um, yeah however I do want to say there's a point where the the flying pinky so the pinky that lifts up really far like this can become problematic. Like it, it can end up throwing your hand posture out of whack. So if I were to play my scale like this with my pinky raised, it creates a lot of tension in this part of your arm. So it is a good idea to start like learning how to, and, and see how it kind of twists your hand a little bit. So when your pinky's relaxed, your hand is more level, but when you have a 
flying pinky, it kind of forces your arm over over a little bit. Um, and it just ends up uh, making it more awkward to play and leaving you more prone to in, uh, injury. So a simple finger exercise that I learned a while back, um, I, it might actually be a hand and exercise, but I can't remember. Basically you mush down all five of your fingers and then lift and press one at a time while keeping the other ones pressed down. If you haven't done this before, it can take a little bit of coordination, especially for the outer fingers to get the control. Um, especially if you find that you have a flying pinky, it's going to want to come up. So keeping it mushed down while you play the other fingers, even like this, can be a really good exercise to correct that. I also think that playing five finger scales uh, while maintaining the tips of your fingers on all the keys is helpful. So see how my pinky just kind of lifted a little bit? That's just a little bit of a natural lift. If you want to make it more challenging for yourself, try to keep all your fingers level on the keys while you play. It's a little bit of a brain exercise too. Um, I mean, you don't have to play like that. It's not like when you play pieces, your fingers are always going to be touching the keys, but it's a good way to get used to the idea of correcting that flying pinky. I mean, honestly, this is an issue that a lot of the time just resolves itself over time the more you play. Do some exercises to speed up the process, but I mean, don't be super, super concerned about it if it's just lifting a little bit. And the last and final question today comes from Pink Kitty Music, who asks, I play well by ear, but I'm really slow at reading, even though I know how to. I'm doing my RCM grade eight, and I need to learn not to rely so much on my ear and memory. This is a question I get asked a lot, and I have a lot of students who go through this too and usually what the problem is is that your your playing level like you said you play at a grade 8 level so you're here with your playing ability but your sight reading is not at a grade 8 level it is not equivalent so that's okay that just means that it it's a weakness that we need to work on like anything else. But what a lot of people end up doing, they're like, well, I'm at a grade eight level, so I'm gonna read all these grade eight pieces, and then they're really, really tough, and you're kind of forced to rely on your memory because your memory is stronger than your reading, and you kind of memorize as you go without actually getting a whole lot better at reading. So what you would want to do in this case is just read easier music and do it every day. I know it sounds like really simple, but that's, they work for me. I'm in the same shoes as you. I've always been a much better ear player than a sight reader. So just being a piano teacher and being forced to read easier music all the time has made me a way, way better sight reader. And even like 10 minutes a day, it, you'll be amazed. Like read some grade one music, read some grade two music and go back to basics. And that's how I think you, you can build that strength. But also don't be afraid to use your ear and memory. That's a strength that you have keep using it. You don't need to like, I don't know, throw it away. You're not like a less, a lesser musician because you're, you're a really good ear player, but you just want to see if you can kind of even it out a little bit by boosting your sight reading skills. And, and I think you'll be able to do that by reading easier pieces. And that is all for today's video. Thank you everyone for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks to everyone who helps make these videos possible, including you, the viewer, and be free. I keep wanting to, I'm in a very free mood today. I keep wanting to call everyone free. Feel free to visit me on social. I exist on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, and you can visit the blog as well, pianotv.net. And we also exist over on Patreon, so you can head over there if you want to as well. I will catch you guys in the next video. An easier version of polyrhythm, because those are both pretty pretty intense examples, is uh, by Mac, Max Richter, Richter. Sorry. <laughs>